Hello and welcome back to Abstract Linear Algebra, the video course where we deepen our linear algebra knowledge. And in today's part 16, we will talk about the so-called Kramian matrix, which is related to the orthogonal projection. This means today we will also learn how we can calculate a general orthogonal projection. But as you might already know, before we go into the details, I first want to thank all the nice people who support the channel on Steady, here on YouTube or by other means. And with the link in the description, you can download additional material for all the videos. And with that said, we can immediately start by recalling what we know about the orthogonal projection. Indeed, the best thing we have is this picture here, where we can see that each vector in the vector space can be decomposed in this way. So for subspace u, we have a vector p in the subspace and a vector n which is orthogonal to the subspace. And this means that n lies in the orthogonal complement of u. And the vector p that lies in u is what we call the orthogonal projection of the vector x onto the subspace u. And now we will show how we can calculate this vector p for a given subspace u. The only thing we assume here is that u is a finite dimensional subspace in the vector space v. And as given in the last videos, f is always a general f vector space together with an inner product. And now we assume that our subspace u is k dimensional, which means we can find a basis with k elements. Hence, if we take the picture above, we see that we can write p as a linear combination with the basis b1, b2 and so on. And this is not a problem because you know this is one of the properties for a basis. And now we only need a good name for the coefficients and maybe let's call them lambda. So we have lambda 1 times b1 plus lambda 2 times b2 and so on. So what we want to do now is to calculate these coefficients such that we get our orthogonal projection. Or more concretely, we assume that we already have such a decomposition and then we figure out what this implies for the coefficients. And in the end, we hope to get a nice formula for these scalars. Okay, very good. And now the overall idea is that we can just use what we already know from the one-dimensional case. And we can apply this one-dimensional case for every vector b, j. Hence, the essential thing we have to do is to calculate an inner product. And there we have b, j together with the vector x, which roughly speaking means that we project our x onto the direction of b, j. And since we already assume that we have our decomposition, this gets much easier now. x is p plus n, and we can use the linearity of the inner product in the second argument, which results in two inner products, and there we already know that n is in the orthogonal complement of u. In particular, this implies that the second inner product here has to vanish. Therefore, only the first inner product remains, and there we can write p as the linear combination with the basis vectors. And there it should not surprise you that we can use the linearity of the inner product in the second argument again. In other words, we can pull out all the scalars and the sum. And now let's actually use a sum symbol to make everything shorter. And there it's important to know that now we have two indices, i goes from 1 to k and j is fixed from the beginning. So what you should see here is that we have k unknowns given as the scalars. And since our variable j also runs from 1 to k, we also get k equations. And now the perfect thing for us is that all these equations are linear equations. So as always in linear algebra, we can rewrite the equations with the unknowns with a matrix vector multiplication. So the whole system of linear equations we can put into a matrix. And we already know it's a k times k matrix. And in a similar way, we have to put the unknowns, the lambda factors, into a column vector. And finally, we also have a right hand side for the whole system. And it turns out, as we have written the equation before, we find it on the left hand side here. 
So in other words, for each j starting with 1, we can already put this to the right hand side here. Okay, then the only thing missing here is the matrix and we know we can write each equation in one row of the matrix. This means the first entry here is b1 with b1, then the next one is b1 with b2 and then we continue until we get to b1 with bk. So you see this is not a problem at all, it's just rewriting this equation here for j is equal to 1 and then into a matrix vector multiplication. And then for the second row here we do the same for j is equal to 2 and then this continues until we get to the last row which is the kth row. And there we have it, the equations we need to calculate the orthogonal projection are given in this matrix vector multiplication. So the solution of this system of linear equations gives us the scalars and therefore the orthogonal projection. And because of that, as you might already know, this matrix here gets a special name. This is the so-called Gramian matrix and usually I denote it with G of B. B is our basis of the subspace and as you can see inside the matrix we only find the basis vectors in the inner product. In other words, in the moment you have a basis, you can always calculate such a Gramian matrix. Okay, so this is the object that helps us finding the orthogonal projection. And you can already check, for the case k is equal to 1, we get out our one dimensional case from before. But now we also have to answer the question, do we have a unique solution in the general case as well? And indeed, this simply means that the matrix G of B here is invertible. And now the good thing is, since we have a square matrix, we already know that this is equivalent to the kernel being trivial. Meaning that the kernel only contains the zero vector. Therefore, let's try to prove exactly that. This should not be so hard, because now we are used to calculate with general inner products. So I would say, let's start the proof by choosing an element from the kernel. So we have a column vector with k entries and let's call them beta1 to beta k. Hence the only thing we have to do now is to multiply g of b to this vector. And then by assumption we know the zero vector has to come out. In other words, we get exactly k equations from the k rows of g of b. So for example, the first row gives us here beta 1 times this inner product plus beta 2 times this inner product and so on. And then the important thing is that on the right hand side we get 0. Okay, so this was the first row, but it's not hard to see, for every other row we just have to change this index here for the first entry in the inner product. Therefore we can just introduce the index j again and then we have all the equations together. We just have to say that this holds for all j from 1 to k. And then in the next step, obviously you might already know that, we can push the scalars into the inner product because we have the linearity. And as always, the linearity also allows to push in the addition. Hence, for all j, we have that the inner product bj together with the whole linear combination is equal to 0. And you should see that the linear combination is given by the basis vectors bi. So this implies the vector that comes out here is definitely 1 in the subspace u. So maybe we call this vector just y and now we know it's an element in u. But now we get a very nice fact here, namely y is perpendicular to each basis vector bj. So we have the orthogonality given for the whole basis b. And there you should recall the proposition we have shown in the last video, because this one tells us that y is already in the orthogonal complement. If it's orthogonal on the basis, it's orthogonal on the whole subspace. Okay, but now you should see we have a strange fact here, y is in u but also in the orthogonal complement of u. But there we already know that the intersection of a subspace with its orthogonal complement is very small. Namely, it only contains the zero vector. 
Therefore, we don't have a choice for y, y has to be the zero vector. And since y was given as a linear combination of linearly independent vectors, we know that the coefficients have to be zero as well. So we conclude that our column vector here is given by the zero vector. Which means that the kernel is trivial and therefore our Kramian matrix is invertible. And there we have it, the unique solution of the system of linear equations from above gives us the orthogonal projection. And this works for every k-dimensional subspace in a vector space with an inner product. So it's very general, but we can definitely look at a very quick example. So let's take R3 together with the standard inner product. And U can be a two-dimensional subspace. Let's simply say it's spanned by two vectors. And now it should not be hard to see that they actually span the yz plane. This means calculating the orthogonal projection of a given vector x should not be so complicated. However, let's forget that and let's just use the Kramian matrix. So in this case it's a 2 times 2 matrix where we just have to calculate standard inner products. So not so complicated, this one is 2, this one is 1 and the other entries are also 1. Now, in the case you forgot the general formula, let me remind you. So there we have it and the Kramian matrix on the left we've already calculated because it was just given by four inner products. However, now we also need the right hand side which has two inner products where x is involved. This is something you should definitely remember, x is only included on the right hand side. And now the first entry here is 2 plus 1, so 3. And the second is just 1. Okay, and there we have it. Now we just have to solve a system of linear equations. And maybe for that, let's use the short notation as always. So here we want the row echelon form, so we could first multiply the second row by 2. And then, of course, we subtract the first row. So we get the result in the second row, which is 0, 1, and minus 1. So this is the row echelon form and we get our two solutions. First, lambda 2 is equal to minus 1. And backward substitution gives us 2 for lambda 1. Then let's put the conclusion here on the left hand side. We can write the orthogonal projection P as 2 times the first basis vector minus 1 times the second basis vector. And then you see, it's not a surprise, what we get is 0, 2, 1. So exactly what we expected when we want to project this vector here orthogonally to the yz plane. So indeed, the x component vanished here. Okay, so now you have seen the Kramian matrix in action. And in the next videos, I will show you how we can improve this whole setup even more. Therefore, I really hope we meet again and have a nice day. Bye bye.